It's time for another Dice Tower Review with Robert Geislinger. It's no surprise to those who know me that I enjoy anything with a Lovecraftian feel to it. Now, I'm not specifically stating Cthulhu-based stories or things like that. I mean the Lovecraftian feeling of going mad while trying to move forward in a story of sorts. Today I'm going to take a look at a solo game that is going to drive me mad while I'm trying to solve cases. Today I'm taking a look at Arkham Noir. So here we're taking a look at Arkham Noir. Now this is collector case number one, which is the real leads, and there is a collector case two as well, which is the king in yellow. For showing you how the game works, we're going to be using Collector Case 1. In this game, you're going to be running some investigations. So we're going to have some victims here that we're going to need to collect leads and eventually, hopefully, close those cases and look at the big picture. The game itself is played over rounds, with each round being divided into two phases, an action phase and a maintenance phase. To start the game out, you're going to have a hand of three cards. On your turn during the action phase, you're going to take the first card from the lead row and you're going to perform one action with it. The first thing you could do is simply take it into your hand as such. However, you have to keep in mind you have a hand limit of three cards. And so in this case, we would have to discard a card. And it's important to note that if you ever have to discard a card with this little hourglass symbol, it's not going to go to your discard discard stack. Instead, it's going to go to your time penalty, which could affect you in the maintenance phase. The next thing that you could do with that card is you could play it to an open case. Now, currently we have two cases here. So you're going to look at these symbols on the side and you're going to need to match them up to the symbols on the side of another card. This one we've gotten lucky happens to say any, so we could place it to this case or to this case. The next thing that you could do is simply to discard it and then play a clue card from your hand instead to one of your rows, following the same as before. Now there's a little more to it, but I'll explain here in a minute how that works. The other thing you can do is discard it in order to close a case. So we could discard it and close one of our cases, and we'll explain how to close cases here in a minute as well. The last thing that we could do during this round is simply discard the card and pass, moving on to the maintenance phase. So let's talk a little bit about when we play the cards to our cases. When you play a card to a case, you're going to, as I said, line it up to things. But then you're going to need to do the actions at the bottom. Now there are two different types. There are ones that are printed in black, and there are ones that are printed in brown. The ones that are printed in brown are typically good things, and you're always probably going to want to do them unless it's going to hinder you, but they are optional. However, the ones that are printed in black are mandatory. The ones that are printed in brown will do things such as allowing you to take another card from the leads row, maybe taking one from the discarded stack, or even searching the discarded stack for a card that you're looking for, or shuffling these back in to stave off having to shuffle it again. However, the black mandatory ones are going to have things where you might have to discard a card from your hand, or you might have to discard a card from the row, or you might have to do a stability check. So let's talk about what a stability check is. Whenever you have to do a stability check, you are going to draw the top card from the stack, and you're going to check it to see if it has a symbol in the corner of it that matches the same symbol that the stability check is. If it does have that symbol on it, instead of discarding it, we're going to put it here in the stability penalty pile that could affect us during the maintenance phase. If not, then we'll discard it as normal. What we're looking to do is build a row of cards here that are going to have different types of clue types on them. Because in order to close a case, it must have at least five unique types on it. In addition, there will be some cards that will have this lock symbol. 
If it has a lock symbol, then we already need to have a key symbol card out in that row in order to play it. Locks are typically, a lot of times, going to be on these puzzle pieces. Why do we want puzzle pieces? Well, puzzle pieces are how we're going to win this game. Because if we go to close a case and it has unique symbols, if we can take that puzzle piece and put it here and still maintain at least five unique symbols, then we can add it here and close our case putting it here. Because what we're looking to do is to get five puzzle pieces here in the big picture that each have a unique clue type associated with them. When you close a case, if you still have an open case, then you will do nothing. However, if it is the last case and you have not won the game, you will need to draw new victims. If a card discarded has the little time symbol on it, which looks like an hourglass, it will not go here and it will instead go to the time penalty slot. In addition, we have these broadcast cards. Now, broadcast cards are cards that will cause something else to happen. There will be an additional card that we take in, but we only draw one of those whenever we get our third card in a clue line that has this little colored symbol on it. In addition, there is what is called the mental strain rule. If you ever have Kate leads in here that go past this card right here, meaning past your seventh card, you do need to start doing a stability check for each card played after. After we've went through and we've done the one action that we are going to do and taken any associated actions at the bottom as we wish, we will move into the maintenance phase. The first thing we're going to do is check victory condition because you do need to get to that phase to win. So that way you still have a chance of losing your mental stability just before. You're going to see if you have five puzzle cards with five different clue types here. If you do, congrats, you've won the game. However, if you haven't, then you're going to move on and do the stability check. So you're going to check the stability penalty area here. If there are five or more here, then the game is over and you have lost your mind and have lost. However, if you are still under it, then you're good to go. You'll check the time penalty. If there are five or more there, then you're going to bring a new victim out here and then reshuffle, move these over to the discard pile. If at any point you go to pull a victim and you cannot, then you have also lost the game. If you ever go to draw here and it's run out, you will shuffle these, but you must bring a new victim out. Once you've done those two checks, you will refill the leads row by sliding everything over and you will begin a new round. Once per game, you will also have a professional contact here who you can use either one of his effects once as a free action. Here we have Vernon Golden, who is a cult of programmer who has an action on one side and he has a different action on the other side. But once you use it, it is lost from the game. Now there was one other type of attribute that I didn't talk about when playing cards and that is this number three here. This number three means that there must already be three cards in the line before that card can be played. So just going through things before we wrap this up, this card needs to have three in it, so we would already need to have three other cards. Now these don't line up on symbols, but well, actually I think we can make them line up on symbols. Maybe. No. Alright, so we would play these. That would then allow us to play this. Well, since we've played this, we can now play a lock card. We now are at one, two, three, four, five. The next two we would start doing stability checks. We currently have one, two, three four unique symbols. Let's see if we could get another unique symbol. Well, here's a skull. It's not legal, but we'll put it in here. So that gives us five unique symbols. We could close out this case with one, two, three, four, and five. We would lose a lock card. Now again, this wasn't legal because I didn't have a matching lock to it, but we're going to go with it. Because that still leaves us five, we could play this legally here and close out this case. Again, once you get five of these puzzle pieces here with five unique clue types, then you have won the game. So that's a look at Arkham Noir. Now, as I've said in other solo game reviews, this is a solo game. And as such, it's already not for a lot of people. But for those who do enjoy solitaire board games, this is a game you definitely want to take a look at. The game itself has great mechanisms if you like puzzles. The setup time on it is pretty simple 
after your first game. I did find going through the rule book that for some reason the setup was confusing despite the fact that there are the cards that you lay out and it tells you where to put things. There was just something confusing looking at that and then looking at the rule book. There is a nice video that the designer of the game has made that goes through setup and then a second part that goes through the rules that if you're looking to play this I definitely recommend looking at that before trying to go through the rules. The puzzle in the game is wonderful and it changes from game to game and that was my first concern when I first opened the game seeing the theme of it knowing it was a solitaire game I was concerned about replayability because in solo games the one thing I look for probably above anything else other than theme is replayability. I don't want a solo game that I'm going to play once and never have a reason to play again. But this game will consistently be replayable. And in fact, it's a very hard game and I still haven't fully got a win in it. The artwork in the game is wonderful and it really supports the theme of investigating these murders and trying to solve these cases. However, with that said, the theme is also something I found a little lacking here. Because the game, at first glance, looks like it should be a story sort of feel to it. And honestly, I found no story in this game other than the back of the box. And that did make me a little sad when I was playing it because I ended up just feeling like I was solving a puzzle and not so much cases. So that is the one downside I had to the game itself. Overall, if you really do like solitaire games and you're drawn to a darker theme, this is a game I absolutely recommend you check out. If on the other hand, you don't like solo games, this game is automatically out for you. But if you don't like a darker theme, this is probably not a game you're going to look at either. I enjoyed the way the time was a factor and your sanity is a factor. That did really draw me more into the theme. Again, I still wish there had been a little more story involved in the game itself as to exactly what I was doing, but I can see how that might have been difficult in these particular mechanisms. I hope this has given you a good idea of whether Arkham Noir might be a good game for you, solo, and I look forward to seeing you folks next time. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.